Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second night of the Relevant Tones 10th Anniversary Festival. My name is Seth Bosted, and tonight is Songs About Buildings and Moods. <laughs> Woo! All right. And um, I want to thank uh, Open House New York Weekend, too, um, that starts tomorrow. So we'll talk a little bit more about that with our, our guests here. So tonight is a, a fairly complex event in, in some respects. Uh, the, the festival is a three-day festival. Last night was music inspired by Rube Goldberg machines, which was really fun. And we had Rube Goldberg's granddaughter was here. Uh, we we're talking about complexity and, and philosophy and all this fun stuff. The stage was completely full. I did this John Cage piece at the end that required a bathtub and all of this amazing, uh, unnecessary stuff. <laughs> that was really a lot of fun and, and a huge spectacle. And then tonight, is is songs about buildings and moods. Um, and this is a, a new series. So uh, Relevant Tones, first of all, is a podcast about the most fascinating time in classical music history, which in my opinion is right now. Uh, you, you can talk about what happened in the past, but it was really just a handful of people in five or six countries, mostly white men. And today we've got composers from almost every country in the world actively contributing to the classical music canon. Uh, the major organizations haven't quite caught up yet, but there's a lot of really fascinating things happening in contemporary music. And uh, so I started the Relevant Tones podcast as a radio show, a syndicated radio show 10 years ago, almost to the day, actually. We went live, um, and now it continues on as a podcast. So first of all, we're celebrating 10 years of all of that fun stuff. Thank you. And um, just to make things really complicated, when I was planning the festival, I knew I wanted to do the Rube Goldberg thing first because I've been thinking about that forever. It's like what kept me going during COVID. I'm like, I'm going to do this Rube Goldberg thing in June. Okay, not June. All right. In, you know, whenever. And then finally in October. Um, but uh, simultaneously, my company, Access Contemporary Music, which um, hosts the Relevant Tones podcast, we had been uh, working with architecture for a long time, starting with Open House Chicago uh, and then Open House New York, uh, a similar company called Doors open, uh, which is in many, many different cities, but for us, Milwaukee, Open House Barcelona, etc. And so tonight, um, you're going to see how this, uh, this uh, project has evolved over time. And one of the things that we discovered during COVID, we used to do this as a, as a live event. So we would put musicians in the spaces as part of Open House, and we would say that we were activating the spaces. And I didn't really, like, I wasn't micromanaging people, like, don't sit and listen. You can walk around the space, and it's just kind of there. Um, but during COVID, we worked in Milwaukee, in, in the City Hall, and in the Wisconsin Black historical society and there was nobody there of course the venues were closed and uh, so we recorded the music not in the venue but in a studio and what I discovered was when we took the photography of the architecture and had the studio music and there were no ambient sounds for me at least and, and I hope you, you'll agree with me it was an incredibly immersive experience and I thought this is amazing we're gonna do this now as a video series and uh, so we called it Songs About Buildings and Moods. So tonight I'm going to show you, these, these videos are all in various stages of completion. The music portions are done, obviously, <laughs> of course. Um, so we're going to uh, show you some of these videos. You're the first people to ever see them outside of our production team, which is really, really exciting. And um, we have special guests here. Architect Daniel Liebeskin um, is here. And from Open House New York, Dorothy Dunn. So I'll bring them up in a little bit. But first, let's go ahead and just dive in. So we're going to watch an 11 minute video. And the, uh, the opening is the series intro. So we're going to pitch this to PBS. We're going to pitch it to the Smithsonian streaming channel. We're going to pitch it around and hopefully get the thing on television. Um, so it's very much geared towards that kind of audience. Uh, so it opens up with the series intro. And then we're going to go. The first venue we're going to see is the Emil Bach House, which which is a Frank Lloyd Wright house in Chicago. And this, this episode is pretty much done. So we're going to hear an interview with John Waters from the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy. And then we'll hear a little bit from the composer. And then we'll see his piece. Um, then I'll bring up our guests. And uh, we'll start the evening proper. So I hope you enjoy uh, the opening of Songs About Buildings and Moods going into, oh, and I went to, I went to also, uh, can't believe I'm not mentioning these amazing musicians who are on the stage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this whole other component of this really complicated night. I could just show you the videos. Obviously, we recorded the music. It sounds fantastic. Um, but why do that? This is a podcast festival. Uh, let's hear it live. And these musicians are um, current fellows and uh, an alumnus from Ensemble Connect, Carnegie Hall's professional development um, ensemble. And they are fantastic. Uh, they sound amazing. So um, the one thing about that is some of the things that you you see musically in the video won't necessarily line up with what they're doing, but um, when, you, when you're just zoning out into the architecture, it's, it's completely fine. And for my two cents, I think it's just fantastic to have the musicians playing live. Um, so let's enjoy. Thank you.
Architecture and music are all around us, so much so that they are often invisible. Architecture is often referred to as frozen music, and the link between them has long been recognized. In terms of form, structure, proportion, and acoustic properties. Equally important in both arts, though, is mood. How does a song make us feel? How does a building make us feel? I'm Seth Bosted, and this is Songs About Buildings and Moods. The Emil Bach House was kind of a revelation for me. I knew I wanted to commission music for a Frank Lloyd Wright building as part of the Songs About Buildings and Moods project, and there's so many to choose from in Chicago, but I wanted to go a different direction, not go with one of the usual suspects, so to speak. So I reached out to the Frank Lloyd Wright Conservancy and spoke to Eric Rogers, and he recommended the Emil Bach House. And lo and behold, it's here in the Rogers Park neighborhood on Sheridan Avenue, and I have biked bust, driven, and walked past this building hundreds of times and never noticed it. So it was perfect for this project. And John Waters from the Conservancy joined me to talk more about the building's past. Well, you know, it's interesting. When we were talking on the phone, I actually had Google Maps up, Street View, and I was looking at it in comparison with the house next door to it. And the house next door is a, is a big, massive sort of brick block building and this comes off as just this little piece of sculpture in a way it's amazing what right packed into this very little house actually in terms of uh, planes and and art glass and all sorts of wonderful little design concepts into a relatively small house it is like a little jewel sitting here on Sheridan Road in some ways, you could look at, look at it and say, point to everything in the house and see how it fits into his career, particularly the exterior with all of the trellises and the way they weave in with each other um, so intense in such a small house. The plan of the house, Wright had developed a plan that he called or he marketed in, in Ladies Home Journal as the fireproof house for $5,000. And it was a very sort of basic living room, dining room, kitchen in a square um, plan. And this is definitely the, the Bach House plan as a variation on that. But it's everything's just a little more complex in this house. You know, the, the number of turns you have to make to get to the front door, which is actually on the back, you know, facing the back. Um, everything is just a little more complex. So they're all things that can be found in Wright's work in general. It's just very, very concentrated in this house in a really wonderful way. I had reached out to six different composers initially for songs about buildings and moods, and I sent them information about each of the sites that I had chosen, and I said, please pick the top three that you want to write for. Just know that you probably won't get your first choice. Incredibly, though, everybody did get their first choice, and Emil Bach was the first choice for composer Amos Gillespie. I'm intrigued by the title, too, because a lot of times composers will just call the piece Emil Bach House, or, you know, the name of the place. But you called your piece Surrounding Elements. Can you talk about that? What was the inspiration behind that title? Yeah, um, well, it uh, kind of factors in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, architectural style with uh, that being the prairie style, which was shared by many architects of the early 1900s. Really, I mean, what happens with the prairie style is that they, you know, they're trying to uh, describe the flat plains of the Midwest, and they're using horizontal lines throughout the structure. Uh, and so, you know, there's this uh, transitional element as you're walking into the house uh, through the winding walkway, 
um, to sort of acclimate you into the indoors from the outdoors. And you're, as you are inside the house, I feel like there are always the surrounding elements from the outside inside uh, with you know the stone from the outside you will see on the inside some of the wood there's a lot of uh, you know wood paneling that's on the inside there's large windows in every room that kind of invite the light and the outdoor scene there's balconies from every room uh, that just sort of you know is literally inviting you to the outdoors I was able to describe that in the music pretty easily when you think about the transition the opening uh, I have sustained pitches in the violin, and it's very slow music, and it just sort of helps to ease you into something that is quite a bit more focused and intense and quicker music. And then the exit music is very similar. Slow, sustained pitches gives you this kind of open uh, kind of feel um, of the outdoors, or exiting into the outdoors. That's how I approached it.
Okay, so I'm going to bring our guests up. Uh, please, a very, very warm welcome for architect Daniel Liebeskind, uh, one of the most accomplished architects of our time. And from Open House, New York, Dorothy Dunn. So we could talk about music and architecture kind of forever. <laughs> but let me just start by asking general impressions of what you've just seen and, and speaking generally um, how you think about both of you, either one of you, music and architecture. Well, first of all, it's breathtaking to hear music composed for a particular building. And I've always thought that, you know, buildings are like human beings. They've got body and they have a soul. And addressing music is addressing something ineffable, but something very precise to a building. It's really a moment of uh, celebration of a creation of a kind of mythology that we've lost because buildings used to be infused with music and music was written for, you know, for churches, for particular buildings. M music was actually written and commissioned. Uh, so this is a kind of a beautiful return in a, an expected angle, so to speak, literally, uh, to a beautiful work of Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, the music is kind of stunning, I thought, because it really captures something of that horizontal, as, as, as the composer mentioned, that horizontality and kind of domesticity of Frank Lloyd Wright's genius, that he was able to create these amazing geometries, but at the same time, they were very, very domestic and very livable, uh, unlike some of his, uh, you know, acolytes, uh, you know, Rietveld and, you know, Le Corbusier, and who did not manage to create that American home image. So I'm all for uh, this beautiful uh, project that you've uh, really created. It's, it's, it's really suggests m you know, many more things that could be done to bring people to architecture through music. You know, it, we always think you know, the only way to bring people to architecture is go to a building. But uh, if you hear you know, Palestrina, if you hear a, a Bach motet, you're motivated to go, you know, to you know, to to Leipzig, or to you know, to Rome, <laughs> <laughs> and to listen to those music musical experiences as part of the buildings. So, yeah. By the way, when I said that every building has a soul, if it's good, there are soulless buildings. There are buildings without any soul. They're just they're just they're just bodies, bones, and and skin, but really meaningless. But if a building has a soul, to me, that building is immortal. And even if you were to destroy the building or damage it, there would still be something present in its absence that we would venerate. And that's true of, of ruins that we go to visit. You know, those buildings are not there. We sometimes go to you know, Athens, Rome, Jerusalem, wherever. And we are, we are caught in a, you know, we don't know what, what to name it, but it's an uncanny experience that we experience something these buildings are not there, you know, there's no Roman Forum, there's no, you know, none of this exists, but we feel somehow transported into the spirit of a certain time. There's a musical word for that, resonance. Ah, resonance, that's good. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that the best word for that is created by a uh, concept, by Hegel, the German, the great German mind, who, who called it the night of preservation. He thinks that the mind has a night of preservation in which it collects things that are dark, it, in the darkness, but as Shakespeare said, you can retrieve those things uh, that have no date any longer, but are still accessible through recollection. So yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. I want to acknowledge, I'm so moved by being in the presence of your performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Another hand for our wonderful musicians, absolutely. The, how we all missed being present with live performances in this crazy time. And I had the privilege of seeing the film with the sound in advance of this. And I was so curious how, I knew it would be different. I am so moved by how powerful it is to be in the presence of performance and to share that. Um, and I loved seeing the musicians on the film with you here with us. It was kind of extending the, the orchestra in a way. I once produced a, um, a program at Taliesin West, Frank Lloyd Wright's great work in Arizona, and we knew he loved Beethoven. So we had uh, musicians there playing Beethoven. Um, so that, that was, and I'm curious, you know, 
what music do you love? Do you work by, do you, um, or work with? But, um, and it was great experiencing Beethoven in Taliesin and West, but this is something new and it pushed it forward. And, and the music really helped me pause visually at aspects of the house. It made walking through and experiencing the space more, um, it brought a depth to it that was really terrific. Well, in my own uh, case, you know, I didn't start by being building architect. You know, I didn't start by apprenticing myself. In office. I never worked in an office in my life. I, I tried for it for two days, but it was too quiet, days. right? It, it, well, it was too kind of, I thought this was going to be a dead end for me. But, you know, seeing all those people with their backs and, you know, doing all those things, it was not, not for me. Uh, and what I did really, and, and really in retrospect, my entire life is very strange because I started by uh, drawings, but I didn't draw buildings. I didn't draw any figurative things because, by the way, I even graduated uh, from a good school in, in New York City. The Cooper Union. And I never drew a building. I mean, I had great teachers who tolerated the fact that I said, look, if you don't have a client, if you don't have a political setting, if you don't have any reality, why would you design an imaginary school, an imaginary you know, hospital, an imaginary house? Uh, so I never did that. But I did pursue architecture through drawing and through music, because I used to be a professional musician in my former lifetime. And so I created a set of scores. I call them chamber works. Uh, they're in the Museum of Modern Art. So several museums have them. They were hand-drawn drawings that, in my mind, were a kind of treatise on the connection between what I knew as a, as a musician and possibilities of constructing a city, a house, a detail at any scale. And uh, these drawings are, you know, if you were to see them, there are 28 drawings, there are 14, they, they, their horizons change, they, they are very systematic and they are, they are done in a very, very precise way. They're not imaginative drawings, kind of feelings, they are very constructed drawings. But all my work comes from those drawings. You know, all my buildings, all my city plans, everything comes, you know, the way, you know, I think of myself, like old fashioned architects like Palladio and Guarini and, you know, they created a treatise of their work uh, in order to then construct a villa, you know, in, on, the, on the Brenta Canal, or, you know, a church in, you know, Torino. So, uh, strangely enough, it was musical, the, the visceral and technical way that music is written, that I constructed, let's say, an architectural system. I mean, it's my own, because nobody probably could do that. You know, maybe, well, there is somebody who could probably could do it, of course. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so in, in retrospect, all my work comes from a, an, a, an intention of linking physically and geometrically the vibrations of a sound, uh, and many sounds, and also geometries in architecture, which are also very similar to constructions of music. And by the way, if you think of uh, the way a musical page looks, if, if you don't know music, if, if you look at a page of, let's say, Stockhausen, right? And a page of a drawing, or an architecture drawing of a complex, let's say, city plan, or they are very similar. They look very, they're graphic. They've got dots, they've got numbers, they've got lines, they've got systems of notation codes that if you have the key, you can unlock and you can hear the music even without anyone playing it. The way you could see in an architecture plan a building rising out of those, those, uh, those graphic signs. So to me, the, the two things are so close together. Uh, and by the way, they both require performance, which is not your own. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have a team, like, uh, you know, these amazing... You have to entrust it to someone else yes, once the, the like design is done. Yes, like great musicians, as you said, or a whole orchestra mm -hmm. that is able to play together without you being there, just according to the document. And, and that always interested me. And music which is not performed is, is there, but it's not there. An architect, a, a building which has been designed but has not been built is there and it is not there. It's, it's the same enigma of, 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 of life and possibility of, of, of projection. So to me, uh, th those two things are very similar. It's a score and a plan. A score and a plan. It's a good way of putting it, yeah. Um, I, wanna, I do want to talk, talk about the, the temporal nature of music and, um, and, and architecture. But first, uh, let's watch another video. This is a, a totally different direction here. Uh, this is called the First Church of Deliverance. So far, we're, we're working in Chicago and New York because those are the cities 
where I have the connections to be able to shoot in, in these wonderful venues. <laughs> and then I'm hoping that, that as more and more people see the series and as we get it out there, that, that people say, oh yeah, and, and I can get almost any venue that I want anywhere in the world. <laughs> That's the, the plan. <laughs> um, but you start with what you know. So um, I actually did not know this place. It's called the First Church of Deliverance, and it's in an art modern style. Uh, the architect is a guy named Walter Bailey. Uh, he was Chicago's first licensed black architect and uh, or Illinois, in the state of Illinois at all. And it's pretty interesting. Bronzeville uh, is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago that was a very historic black neighborhood. Um, it's where uh, Mahalia Jackson, we were talking about her earlier, she came from. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, came from there, grew up in, in uh, Bronzeville. And it's also when uh, Mies van der Rohe came to Chicago, he set up camp at IIT. The IIT campus is in Bronzeville as well. So it's this really fascinating place because you have this black church called the First Church of Deliverance that is also kind of, I mean, just done up in this amazing architectural style. Um, but its mission is really at the center of it. So this video doesn't have the interviews yet. Uh, we haven't gotten the interviews with the, with the pastor, Pastor Bryson, who's a marvelous musician himself. Uh, we haven't gotten that done, and we haven't gotten the interview with the composer yet, but I do want to just say, because it is an empty church, the composer talks a lot about how they put the cross on the ceiling, uh, so you look up to see your savior in the church. And so we did a lot of, of that in the video to make sure you see that. And um, yeah, let, let, let's watch this. The music is by Regina Bayaki. It's for solo piano. Uh, Joanne Kang is going to play it for us. And, uh, and then we can talk about um, this church. And, and this church really has a kind of narrative in a way, too, because not only is it powerful architecture in, in, a, in a powerful community, um, and it has this really deep mission, um, but it also is this really resonant, meaningful place for, for, I mean, thousands of people because they also do a lot of broadcasting. Um, they're not just a church. They're also a broadcast center. And um, so anyway, let's, let's uh, enjoy First Church, and then we'll chat a little more. Self deliverance and first church of deliverance that means so much to me in my personal spiritual uh, journey because I always pray for deliverance not only for myself but for the world and so just that whole concept of being in prayer and I associate that of course with this house of prayer and uh, I wanted to write something that captured the spirit of the church so this is my musical portrait first church of deliverance
So of course I see these things and I think, uh, oh gosh, we haven't got the exteriors in yet. <laughs> we, were, we were out in Bronzeville a couple, uh, about a month ago to do the drone shoots and we just haven't got them put in yet. Uh, you know, these, these productions, are, are, it's an enormous amount of work, <laughs> of course. Um, but nonetheless, that's the interior of the First Church of Deliverance. Now here we have a, a very different kind of scenario, right, from the Emil Bach. I mean, because there's a lot of, uh, there's religious associations, there's a lot of things. So I want to talk about kind of narrative in music, narrative in architecture, how we experience. We experience music. It's always interesting to me, you know, you hear a piece of music and in the beginning you're thinking, oh, I, okay, this is what this is, I like this, I don't like this. There's a lot of times where I don't like a piece of music until the end, and then that it changes everything I was thinking before. Um, so I guess, Daniel, I'll throw this question out for you. I mean, do you feel the same way about architecture? How do you, how do you want people to experience your architecture, and how do you experience it? I don't think you want people to experience architecture in an intentional way. You don't design a building for users, at least I don't. I don't think of, I'm going to design a building that people will like. I'm going to design a people. You design for an unknown, you, you, you design for somebody others, somebody who you don't know at all, somebody who will come into the building, you know, a young person who has never been there, who's just born. Uh, it's not for anyone living now. It's, it's for someone else. That's how I think about it. And it's, it, you know, if you tend to design a building for a very particular use, very particular group of people, I think it's very limiting because that group will change in time. So in a way, the question you're asking is a very difficult one to answer. How, how do you, you know, but it's, it's the art of music, right? I mean, it's, 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 it has its own integrity. And what I really uh, liked about this last uh, architectural uh, vision and the music is that it erased the boundary which we usually have between sacred and profane. It was suddenly like a democ democratization of belief, which really is fantastic, I thought. That music is already sacred somehow just by sounding a note. The uh, word I kept thinking about, and I look forward to seeing the exterior shots because it's part of the idea of procession, which is also a word that's often used for religious practice and experience. The idea that you, uh, you anticipate you approach the design of how you enter a space, you know, the, the weight of the doors, what you see first, how different aspects of a building kind of unfold or landscape. Um, I think that that's, that's something that I think is very, you must think about it as you design a space, kind of what comes first, then next, and it builds, and then, you know, uh, and then the overall experience. And I, I think of that as almost a dance or choreographed uh, through design. But music does that also. Well, it's true, except that we, with our technological, uh, technological means, when we enter a building, we've already seen it from some other angle. We've already seen the city from other angles. It's not as if you're entering the building in the old times and you're alone on the road and you're alone in the door. You have seen the building already in Google Earth. You've experienced it in, in many different media already. You've experienced the city, even, even if you've never been there. You know, people have been, look, I think the best example of it is Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, what is that book about? It, it's supposed to be about Dublin, but it's really about the whole world. Using the very particular addresses in Dublin to give you the sense that there is an encyclopedia of you know, unbelievable things that he has mastered all over the world. So in a way, what you're saying is, is, is very interesting that, that, yeah, the kind of correspondence, that, what is that narrative? Beginning, middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. Yeah, I always say you don't go to Italy to look at architecture unless you've spent a lot of time studying that architecture. And it's, I think a big part of it is the anticipation. And then what you bring to the experience, because how you're gonna experience a building or a park is different than me, but because we, we are different people contributing to that space through I, our experience. You're very correct. I just wrote an introduction to a exhibition at the Royal Academy in London of Helen Binet, a great uh, architectural photographer. And I noted that really most architectural photographs when you go to see the building, they're, you're very disappointed in the building. You see an amazing photograph of Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, right? You know, in the 1920s, in the Bauhaus period. Then you go to the now reconstructed, and you think it's completely different. It's not at all the building you expected to see. Because also, of course, the photography undermines 
uh, the three-dimensional space and create its own interpretation of space in two dimensions. So we have to deal with all sorts of disruptions. There's no continuity of the kind that we sometimes long for because it's full of gaps and voids and full of transformations that create a very different spatial experience for us when we go to this church. But now that I've seen it, I want to really go to see it because it's colorful, obviously, and it's got amazing small details within its sort of congregation, which are fascinating. The details are amazing, and I mean, just the audacity of putting this neon aluminum cross on the ceiling. I mean, it's yeah, just it's like, and very it works. Disco. And it lights up. I mean, yeah. you know, and it makes a ton of noise when it lights up, oh, too, by the way. It buzzes. Bzzz. <laughs> 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 I mean, you feel like, you know, I, I told them it's like, like art, modern art deco meets Afrofuturism or something. And it's just this amazing, I mean, and, and the walls are this yellow, and on the front, it's got these, um, you know, these towers on it. So you'll see the exteriors eventually. Um, but I, I love what you said about Google Earth. Oh, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, no, it's very interesting. Why is this book, is, is this building, which is fascinating, not in the history books? Mm -hmm. You know, who decides what buildings are important? How is it that we have acquired this kind of uh, fake authority of what are important buildings? Well, it's racism, part of it, in this case. Mm -hmm. It's all sorts of uh, uh, bigotry against certain forms which we are not familiar with. You know, if you showed uh, many people the cross on the scene, they would say, well, that's nonsense, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, it should be frontal. But I love it because I think in our era we can change all those categories. We can bring people and architecture and music into a, in a much more equal, egalitarian way which doesn't have this you know, fake authority of someone saying, I put the following buildings as the great icons of the world. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of 19th century or you know, authoritarian. Absolutely, it's something we're dealing with in classical music too. I mean, we're re-examining yeah. the entire canon and saying, yeah. you know, uh, this, is, uh, this music is fantastic, but so is a lot of things that are happening today. Exactly. Um, and and, when you, and you know, in my opinion, I think in the opinion of a lot of people, it doesn't matter if it's jazz, classical, rock music, whatever, when you start to put somebody on a pedestal, it, it's damaging for the art form as a whole, because then you're saying, well, you can't live up to this. That guy's carved in stone. <laughs> Nobody else can live up to it. And, it, and it's just it, it, tremendously damaging, yeah. I think, yeah. to any art form. It's something I love about the visual arts world, that they, they do that to a certain extent, but there's also that you know, they really like to tear down their icons and start fresh as well, which I think is a very healthy thing to do. Well, you know, the, the art form which is most policed by the state is architecture. Because you can write a piece of music and not be arrested. Right? Or you can, you know, you can time, buy, yeah. you, can, you can write a poem or, or you know, you, you, in a free society, you, can, you will not be arrested, you will not be confronted. But to build even a small addition to a small house, you need legal permission. <laughs> Which is kind of amazing that people have agreed to this egregious form of control of, of space. And I have no idea where it comes from, why we have agreed to it. <laughs> The whole, con we, the whole concept of land ownership is, you know, we can go yeah. into that because that's so fascinating. But even, you do want it to stand up. <laughs> but, even more, but even more interestingly, if you take a city like Houston, right? Houston has no uh, zoning laws. Mm. It's very tame. So I always think, like, if you remove all, the, where are the conventions coming from that mm. create still pretty much the same city that has the same, different laws and zoning laws and so on, it, Houston is still like that. It's not a wild city where it should be. You know, given its kind of Texan idea, wow, we can do anything we want, it's still pretty much like a city on the East Coast. <laughs> you were asking about the stories, and I thought that was a great question to ask after we've seen and been through media in a church, because a space like that is full of stories. All architecture is full of stories, historic sites in particular. Um, but churches are, that's really a big reason why they're built. But the music, I think, was a nice transition for feeling at home and welcome there, even if you don't know all the iconography and stories of that space. So, and I, I think music has worked wonderfully in churches, not only to tell the stories, um, to move us, but uh, as that kind of transitional um, bridge. It's pretty new. You know, when I first designed the Jewish Museum in Berlin, uh, it had a narrative. You know, it had an, you go underground, you go into the darkness, you, you emerge, there are three roads that lead, one leads to a dead end, so on, so on. I was highly criticized by the great historians of architecture in Germany, by the great experts, that a building should not tell a story. 
because abstract buildings don't tell any stories. They are, they are abstract spaces. You, they, they, they don't have a story. Uh, the fact that now a building can be conceived to have a story is something relatively new. And now music always had it because music always also had texts. Right? If you had you know, Passion of St. John, right? it's, it's not just an abstract story. It's a real story. There's a beginning, there's an end, and there's a redemption, and so on. But uh, I just want to point out that the idea of a story, a story in a city, you know, that, that this public space should, should, should tell you something, should have a meaning, and not be just a bunch of you know, uh, uh, abstract notions. That's, I think, uh, really 21st century. But I think in religious architecture, stories yes, have yes. always been key. Of course, yeah. of course, in religious architecture, definitely. But not in, let's say, the secular space of mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I have a question. Do oh, you, yeah, sure. What parameters do you give the composers? A certain amount of time or? I, I was just going to bring that yeah. up, actually, because um, you know, the First Church of Deliverance is, is a, a, a black church serving a black community. And, um, you know, so we, we chose a wide range of composers, but um, Regina Bayaki happens to be a black composer, but I didn't want to say you have to write for the First Church of Deliverance because I don't know what you're going to do. So uh, as I said in the opening um, for the Emil Bach House, I chose six composers in the beginning, myself and five others. Of course, I, I snuck myself in there. And, um, and then I said to everybody, you know, we, we chose a, a, a diverse group of people, but I want you to choose the buildings that you wanted. And actually, Regina at first wanted to do the, the Emil Bach House, and then um, she changed her mind and said, what am I doing? I grew up in Bronzeville. <laughs> this church is so important to me. Um, you know, I just, she was thinking she wanted to do something different and, and step out of, of that area. And then she said, no, actually, this is really important to me. And I want to do it. And at first, she was going to write for piano and, and the B3 organ. You see the B3 organ in there. Because historically, the first church of deliverance was, uh, I think, I hope I get this right, but the first black church to incorporate the B3 organ into its services. Um, and then she said, no, I want it to be this intimate piano piece and this pianist his name is Thomas Jefferson I want him to play the piano because he's the guy and I heard him play I'm like yeah he's, he's the guy <laughs> um, and so yeah it, it was it's, it's really fascinating to me and I've been doing this for, I've been commissioning composers throughout my whole career and it's just fascinating how the right people find the right space and, and I don't want to get mystical but like I actually do believe because I, I really don't try to control the process every once in a while it gets a little weird two people want the same thing and I have to like put on my manager hat but I mean most of the time it actually works out. People find the space they were meant to write for. Do you prescribe the length of the composition? Yeah, keep it short. Oh, okay. <laughs> I loved it that the, the film started with an the organ music. That yeah, so cool. everyone is a little different. Yeah. I mean, so and, and what we're what we're dealing with now is, um, you know, so when I'm walking up to the Emil Bach House, I, I wrote some some incidental music. What we're trying to do now is, when you have interviews or you have things and you want a little music under it, how do you differentiate that from the piece that is the that is the you know, the centerpiece of the episode? Because um, uh, the, the first time the team, we had this wonderful production team. Um, one of the camera operators here in New York does live in HD at the Met. I mean, they're like really top notch people. But but they sent me back my piece, which we'll see in a minute, for the Driehaus Museum, and they were using my music on the underscoring, and I was like, no, <laughs> that is art. That is not underscoring. <laughs> there's a difference. There's a big difference. Same in architecture, same in any field. There's something that's meant to be, you know, that is art, and there's something that is just functional, that's there to what do What do you mean underscoring? I'm going to... Underscoring is just any music that goes under something. Um, uh, you, know, you can do it in a play, you can do it in a film, um, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of an art, and I'm not saying it's bad music. It's not. It's kind of an art, actually, to write music that's just interesting enough but not enough to compete with what you're, what you're hearing and seeing. Um, so let, let's go to the, we're gonna go to two in a row right now. And what I wanna do is just provide a little context. Um, I loved what you were talking about earlier, Daniel, when you said that we used to commission music for buildings. That is so true. And that's something that has been starting to happen for us at Access Contemporary Music now as we're working in these spaces. So it started with uh, the TWA Hotel. We had the great good fortune uh, as part of the Open House New York Gala, uh, I think in 2019, when the hotel was, was opening to the public for the first time, we commissioned four composers. Once again, I snuck myself in there. And, and three others. Um, we'll see that at the very end. The TWA Hotel, to me, is just the, the piece de resistance. So I put it at the end. And it's Stephanie uh, Ann Boyd's piece. Um, and we performed them live as part of the, the gala. And it was just, it was really incredible. And I told uh, Greg Westner, who was the executive director at that, at that time of OHNY, that, that we used to do this. <laughs> um, well, anyway, the Milwaukee Ballet LA asked us to do the same thing, to write music. They were opening up a new space, a really wonderful new space. And so the composer, Gene Pritzker, is actually here, uh, which is really great. And this is just the video. So this is how we used to do it. Um, so the, the ballet building is open for the first time. People are coming through as part of Doors Open, interacting with the music. And we'll go straight from that 
to uh, the Nickerson Mansion, the Driehaus Museum. Uh, Richard H. Driehaus just passed away, but he was one of the great philanthropists in architecture and music, and his Driehaus Foundation is one of our sponsors. So I wrote the music for the Driehaus Museum. It was like a tread lightly kind of thing, right? Because he's our sponsor, you know? So, um, and that one is an interesting building because uh, Mr. Nickerson in, in the 1900s, he, ran, uh, he, got, he made his fortune running whiskey distilleries. Unfortunately, whiskey distilleries burned down, um, and they did several times, and he developed this real fear of fire. And then he moved to Chicago like two years before the great Chicago fire. And he was like, oh my God, you know, like this is way too much. So he commissioned an architect to build a fireproof house. And it's the first fireproof house in Chicago. It's made of marble. And so it's called the Marble Palace. And so here, speaking of narrative, I went, oh, a, a Jean's piece, by the way, for the Milwaukee Ballet is called Dancing About Architecture, which is a quote by Frank Zappa. Um, and my piece is called the Marble Palace because it relates to this idea. And I really went with this narrative of a person who has all the material comforts. He's got these amazing Tiffany lamps, this dome. I mean, the house is, is stunning, but it also doesn't have a lot of natural light. It seems very much driven by angst and, and fear to a certain extent to me. Um, so let's do those two, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more.
So I wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, obviously in the Milwaukee uh, ballet one, we're, we're thinking about, well, first of all, let me, um, uh, Gene Pritzker, <laughs> the <laughs> composer of Dancing About Architecture. And, um, you know, in, in the Milwaukee ballet, we're, we're very clearly, you know, we're not working at the same level, obviously. Um, our, our goal was just to capture the experience, to, to uh, document that it happened. I mean, for our funders and, and people like that, uh, we weren't yet thinking about things. And you can tell, I mean, first of all, it's not an HD. There aren't multiple cameras. There's no steady cam, you know, no drone, <laughs> none of that stuff. But it's, it's very obvious that the, 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 the filmmaker is really focused as much on people as on uh, the uh, the music. And I, I wanted to contrast that, because that's how we were working for many years, where, where um, people experiencing the music was what we were trying to show. And then in Driehaus, that was the first one that we did. And I and the, the production team had a ton of conversations. We were thinking, okay, the only people anyone's gonna see are the musicians. So we played around with all these ideas. Like, we were actually going, <laughs> it's a stupid idea, it's my idea. Uh, like, I'll have them at that dinner table, you know? Like, <laughs> playing at the table, you know? Like we we were going to just put the musicians in different places. And then um, Dave Less, uh, one of the filmmakers, so the, the, the filmmaking team is Dave Less and Kim Schlechter. Uh, they're the, the, are my uh, executive producers with myself. And um, Dave had an idea of, uh, to do a shot that was kind of straight out of Hitchcock, where we, we, we go up the stairs, we see Nick the cellist doing that wonderful, so it's a very glassy sound, harmonic kind of sound. And my idea was that you're, you were beckoning you out of the everyday world, because the Driehaus Museum is not the everyday world. It's like a sick, weird play play. play pen for, you know, weird, maladjusted rich people. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and you go in and up and then around, you see Zach playing the bass clarinet, you hear the violin, then you finally come around, you see Jeff, and the camera goes right into Jeff's back, and then boom, there's a shot, and they're all three down below. So anyway, I, I want to talk about um, people, uh, because I think that's a really interesting thing. And just as you were watching both videos, thinking about people, thinking about uh, music, what are some, some thoughts that you've uh, had? I loved how, um, I love that you pulled that out because I was going to say that the first piece, you didn't know that that was a building built for ballet. But the film invited you to watch people indoors and out, walking down the stairs. You had a sense of bodies moving through space. And that was, um, so it, it just happens to be also a building that was built for ballet. So that was... Correct? Yeah, so I mean, it, doors open is, and, and open house is supposed uh -huh. to give you access to the whole space, but they were doing a rehearsal in the, in the ballet area, uh -huh. so we couldn't go in there. <laughs> but it was okay, because you even the people outside the window I was looking at, and that lovely little girl playing with taking her shoes on and off, I mean, how many of you found delight in that, and just how we inhabit space and spend time in space with our bodies. And the, but in my career, I've done a lot of work developing tours for and experiences for particular sites. And in the Driehaus Museum uh, piece, I would have no idea 
where to go and how to go left and right in the connection to be in, in between the rooms, which is fine. I, I, I think it would be a mistake to say, oh, this is going to basically uh, you know, be a tour of the house with music, which I was never yeah, your intention. Yeah, we definitely didn't want that. I yeah, know, I know. Yeah. But the focus on the details and being kind of happily lost in those extravagant details, now the filmmakers also focused on the details of the musicians. I really like that that uh, connection. Um, Two humans. To, to humans, yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind yeah. of details in, in the objects and then moments of detail with the musicians, which we have not seen in the other films, really. Not as much, right. Treehouse, we focused on the musicians mm -hmm. a lot, and, that, you know, and, and then this narrative. So it ends with, the, 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 you see the fireplace at mm -hmm. the end. There's several references to fire throughout the, the piece. Well, the last piece is really kind of amazing, but I don't think it's about people at all. It's about ghosts. <laughs> that thing is re really, to me, the music, the musical structure uh, and the instruments were straight out of Henry James' Turn of the Screw. If you read, you know, you know Turn of the Screw. It's really about America and it's about evil, also in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a quintessence. And this was very powerful. It showed that the music is probably a better guide than having a plan. I don't know this house, mm -hmm. but the music was a perfect <laughs> instrument uh, of kind of planning of the, of the ghastliness. Uh, and I really thought of the sirens at Odysseus. You know, remember? You know, oh, that stop Lure your you ears. In. Yeah, p yeah, stop your ears or, or you're gonna be lost in this, in this, in this nightmare. You're gonna be the victim of this house. But I, I think it captures really the, the, a powerful thing about uh, the ghost that, you know, building spaces that are built for people have also ghosts. I mean, you don't have to be a, a cultist to feel it, that, that there, is a, there is something uncanny about certain spaces. You feel somebody has been there before, and you even know what they believed in and, and what they did, maybe crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I like I, I, your, I I, your reference to haunted, ghosts and haunted, haunted, but I didn't feel the evil connection, but it was... There, there were a lot Haunting. of financial crimes in that house, I think. Oh. Uh, <laughs> many financial crimes, many white collar crimes were committed you know, over cigars. There's a, there's a smoking room in the house that's all done up in this Turkish wallpaper because in 1890 or whatever, uh, things uh, you know, in the Middle East were all the rage among wealthy people. Well, and I, I all that's still to, there. I, I have to say, I had this experience personally. I was invited as an artist in residence to Salzburg, you know, the castle, mm -hmm. which is a great invitation to be a visiting professor you get very well paid, you have students from all over the world. And I thought, this is amazing. I'm gonna spend, you know, the summer months, you know, in the city of Mozart, and I'm gonna go to the castle. And I walked into the castle, and there were, you know, Jim Dine, there were f other artists there who were part of the summer uh, school. And I came back, and I turned to him, and we had rented a house and everything with the kids, and I said, I can't go back there. She's so like, what do you mean you can't go back there? Did you have a bad meeting? Did... No, it was beautiful, people. That... I just can't go back there. I said, why? I don't know. I, I... Later on, I discovered it was used by Nazis in a particular way. So it, you know, it had its own history. But I experienced the ghost, and I think we all do in some way, maybe in more or less consciously. I think this uh, also showed a beautiful uh, a sort of narrative about you know, the, the staircase, uh, the strange back, uh, back figure of Hermes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the God of Interpretation, They right? were both drawn, both the filmmakers were very drawn to all the little figures in the yeah. house. There's tons it, of little it, figures. It's really kind of a spectacular piece with the music. Who wrote the music? I wrote, I wrote it, it's mine. Oh my God. <laughs> Is that wonderful? <laughs> that, Congratulations. Really, I, I have to say, very, really beautiful. Thank you very really. much. Um, you know, so one of the things that, that from, the, from the very beginning, when I was thinking about this project, I started reading books on music and architecture, there's like four, and, uh, you know, there's more than that. But uh, they, they talk a lot about the technical aspects of it, proportion, things, you know, these things that I was talking about in the intro a little bit, to a certain extent, they talk about a lot of um, technical things, and that was something that I, I say in the intro we didn't want to do. We wanted to talk about emotion. How does this song make you feel? How does this building make you feel? I mean, as the composer, any of, of us composers, when we write for a space, we have this tremendous power, because we're going to affect how you, how you experience this space. When you watch that video, I mean, Gene or any other composer would do something completely different to the Driehaus Museum. Well, I used literally a piece of music in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, if you know the project. There's a void which is traversing through the whole building. And I used it to complete an opera, incomplete opera by Schoenberg, 
Moses and Aaron. You know, he stopped, you know, he was kicked out of Berlin. He was, uh, you know, the Jew who had to leave. Uh, and he never completed it. So it ends in an aporia, Act 2, where Moses calls to God, and there's just silence. And then he didn't complete the opera. It's, it's, it's performed in two acts, but the third act. So I thought it, the architecture could complete an act. I could take the score of Schoenberg, which I did, which is also mystical. It's, it, there is a certain numerological uh, division of 12 and 60 and so on. And I used it to complete the music in the echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across the void. So when you are in the museum, there is a different sound when you cross the bridges across the void. And if you listen, if one listens, they're busy, people are there, but if, if you listen, you hear the footsteps. And that was the completion. That was the end. That was the answer that Moses never got from Schoenberg, but he got in my museum. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so music can be used uh, technically in architecture to, s to create a space. Uh, very accurately, I think, with the score of Schoenberg. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, there's a Greek composer named Yanis Sinakis, who was a composer and an architect, and he actually wrote music oftentimes on the, the graph paper yes. instead, of, yes. instead of staff paper. Uh, I had a crazy idea to do one of his pieces as part of this, but uh, oh, that, I love like 62 musicians, it wasn't going to work out. Well, you know, he, <laughs> he, he built for himself. I mean, he worked in Le Corbusier's office. But he built for himself. Mm -hmm. it w it's not a Corbusian project. It's really Zanakis, a, a pavilion for his the music. The pavilion, yes, yes. The, the Phillips Pavilion for the World's yeah, Fair in Brussels, yeah. and it's an amazing thing because it wasn't just music. It was projections, which at that time were a little primitive. But anyway, he had images. People were lying on the floor horizontally, which Strom uh, which uh, Stackhausen and others la later adopted. But he created a total musical architectural experience which is kind of what Wagner wanted to do, isn't it, in Bayreuth? Oh, absolutely, yeah? absolutely, yeah. By, well, I mean, you know, it was also a monument to his own ego, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, it was Wagner. <laughs> Part of it, I mean, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, was the, it was the place for his Gesamt, you know, total artwork, yeah. Gesamtkunstwerk. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. That, that was the idea behind yeah. it. Um, okay, let, what I want to do, because I want to make sure we get to talk about TWA. So let, let's do, um, oh, Gotha, yeah. we're going to do two in a row now. Speaking of ghosts, we're gonna, these are the last two. Uh, we're going to do the Morris Jamel Mansion, which is in Washington Heights uh, and, and is reputed to be haunted. In fact, they're they're going to be doing a, a haunted night for uh, sure. Halloween. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And actually, it's funny because I, I assumed um, the, the most famous resident. And again, we don't have the interviews yet for this one, so it'll just be the music. Uh, but the most famous resident of the Morris Jumel Mansion was Eliza Jumel, and I assumed it was her ghost. And, and maybe she's there, but she reported seeing ghosts even in her lifetime. Something that I learned. Um, from, uh, from, from Shiloh Holly, who runs the, the museum. And uh, that was a pretty fascinating fact. And uh, th this, this is a really interesting house in so many respects. I mean, it's, it's historical. Again, you know, for me, uh, personally, I think for a lot of us, any house that a lot of different people lived in over time, you know, whether there's ghosts or whatever, but there is always this kind of sense of melancholy. It's something that I reacted to in my piece for Driehaus. Um, and uh, so the composer here is Nilo Nombeko, and she went with a kind of a completely different idea because the house dates back to before the colonial era. So she went with, uh, she, she wrote the intervals in the music that kind of come from that time. It's almost renaissance -y in a way, by way of American colonialism, which is kind of interesting. Um, that one is for flute, oboe, and bassoon, and I'd hit the limit of my budget, so we're going to watch it on the, um, on the video. <laughs> and uh, then the last one is the, the TWA Hotel, this marvelous structure by Eero Saarinen, uh, 1962. We're, we're in, we're in you know, jet age optimism. I mean, John Glenn is circling the earth. Um, everybody in, in America is thinking technology and globalism are going to save us. <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards because we kind of know where that went. Um, so let's enjoy uh, the last two videos, please. And, and, and TWA will be performed live. The Morris Jamel Mansion was built just before the Revolutionary War and is the oldest still standing residence in Manhattan. I'm in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan, and as you can see, this is not what most people associate with New York City. Uh, we have trees here and grass and parks, uh, there's bluffs and rocks, all kinds of things you don't normally associate with the big city. And if you go inside the mansion, you step back into time. You'll find that the period decor is exactly the way it was in the time of Eliza Jumel. And there are plenty of little details to inspire a composer.
introduce our musicians really quickly. Yasmina Spiegelberg on clarinets. Laura Andrade on cello. Halam Kim, viola. Jennifer Liu on violin. Joanne Kang, piano. Please a big hand for our musicians. Uh, they learned a lot of music very quickly for this. And uh, they did a marvelous job, as you can hear. And, and if you guys want to just um, head off the stage, go ahead. <laughs> so we'll talk for just a couple more minutes, because I really want to talk about what we just saw. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, tomorrow night is night three of the Relevant Tones 10th Anniversary Festival. Carla Kilstead is an incredible violinist, vocalist, and composer. And she has written a, a piece that is actually an, an album called Necessary Monsters, inspired by Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian writer. Um, his book, The Encyclopedia of Monsters. And so we have a wonderful uh, author named Stephen Asma here, and he has written a book about the psychological importance of monsters in mythology, in, in, in movies, I mean, everything. So, you know, a little pre-Halloween monster fun. And it's a 10-piece band, all-star players, some of New York's top musicians. So that's how we'll close out the festival tomorrow night. If you're curious what living composers are up to when they're not writing music about architecture, because <laughs> the Relevant Tones podcast is a lot more than just architecture, um, check us out. Subscribe to the podcast. There are QR codes out in the lobby. Uh, they'll take you to Anchor. So um, just really quickly, I want to talk with our guests one more time. Uh, big hand, please, again, for Daniel Liebeskind and for Dorothy D. <laughs> Dorothy Dunn. <laughs> you're D. <deep. laughs> um, so, you know, the... the, the the project is called Songs About Buildings and Moods. Mood is really at the, at the heart of this uh, project. So let, let's talk about that. What, what, how, I mean, the mood was a radical shift, right? <laughs> uh, what, what, what were you thinking as you watched Morris Jamel shift into TWA? Well, what was really fascinating is how close the form of the instruments on the stage were to the forms of the building. You know, if you look at the violin, you look at the, the windows, if you look at the shape of these instruments, which are usually taken for granted, but instruments are among the most beautiful objects ever created because they are apparently functional, but also mythological and also symbolic and also uh, beautiful. You know, like Stradivarius costs more than a building, many more times than a, than TWA building. So I, 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 my thought here was how close the geometries of the TW terminal, which were not generated by a computer. You know, Erosarin worked with pencil and in a classical way, very controlled and very deliberate, not a, a manipulation of an algorithm which gives you a, a, a clever shape, which is relatively just a meaningless shape that is cute for about five seconds and horrible after it's built. But this shows, I think, the power of geometry and the power of the music that sort of rises with these instruments to, in a way, to coincide with it in a strange way. Uh, you know, the music, too, was very, to me, very harmonic with, with that building. I really loved the flow of these two films, um, the visual flow, and I felt that the music was my companion as I explored. Each one had surprises, um, and, and um, I just liked the music as a companion to experience those buildings that I knew quite well differently. Ah, yes, thank you. That's one of our taglines. <laughs> Songs about buildings and moods invites you to, uh, to, to, to experience architecture and music differently. Oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's space bar. <laughs> That's later. <laughs> You're not invited to that part. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but you said something earlier in introducing uh, these, this piece, uh, TWA, that it was done in a certain period of America competing right, in space. Right, exactly. Right, and, and there is something about that, that drama of architecture that has to do with greater worlds. Uh, it wasn't created just uh, arbitrarily. It, it's part of a psychology or mythology of competing with the Soviet Union. Uh, and there's something interesting, I, and I was wondering about the music. Uh, can you retrospectively go back into a time when you're a contemporary composer? It's very difficult to sort of make that, uh, you know, kind of strange coincidence. But anyway, it's very interesting to hear that music with this, and, and as the haunted house was. And by the way, when I was looking at those uh, three... Among other things. <laughs> I think that was a very optimistic period, too, for the Morris Jamel. You know, it was it, it, built it, at a time of... It, it was optimistic. Ambition. But it was, but it's haunted. And I think we look at politics today as, you know, right-wing and this, and the movements and this, and anti-vaccine. But, you know, there is a nemesis in the soil of America. All those people were murdered 
all those people whose land was taken away. And I felt that it somehow the music, the portraits, uh, the, smi the smiles or, 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 or the expressions, those little things on the table, it was a commentary of some sort on something we probably don't even fully realize that, uh, yeah, that something is happening which we don't fully understand. And it's rooted in crimes. Sorry, it is, because it, where did that piece of land come from? Mm -hmm. It was, um, you know, native people lived there. It, it wasn't, you know, bought uh, from. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so uh, what, I want to talk just really briefly. The TWA was a flight terminal, and now it's a hotel. What, what are your thoughts on repurposing spaces? I think it's fantastic. I'm dying to go to that hotel <laughs> after seeing. Oh, you all should go there. And that <laughs> pool, the infinity pool it's, overlooking the runway. It's, I, I think it's really, it really shows that great buildings can change their functions completely and continue to, to, to live. Like all the lofts in New York, they were built as industrial buildings, and yet they're most attractive places for people to Try to get so yeah. I think that's the nature of good architecture: good proportions, incredibly good materials, uh, a certain raw power of light, uh, and 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 materials. So yeah, I, I think good buildings are sustainable because they are also memorable. You know, the, the other buildings at the, you know at the Kennedy Airport were torn down. Nobody cared at all. But this one, somehow people cared because it was memorable. And they did a great job with it. It, it is it's such a fun space. Yeah. I mean. And before it became a hotel, though, it was a featured space for Open House New York. And when mm -hmm. it was an abandoned space, people on rainy days sometimes would line up hundreds to just have access to this space, to, to wander around it. Um, people flew in. Um, some of them were former TWA employees. They wore their uniforms because that building meant so much to their life experience their sense of history, mm -hmm. and um, it actually helped convince the eventual hotel owners that the hotel was viable. If on a rainy Sunday in October, people would line up to and wait for a long time to have access to an abandoned building, there's something there, and and it's it there is, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I want to mention in the opening shot, the flight attendants are walking out. We didn't stage that. We just got <laughs> lucky. Probably. Yeah, we just got completely lucky. I remember looking at the cameraman going, oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's our opener. <laughs> that's, that's our opener right there, folks. Well, we have the five moment. episodes done uh, that you saw. Um, we're looking at a, a couple of other locations in New York City. And um, we've got so, you know, a little bit of work to do on the audio uh, here and there, as I'm sure you heard. We've got some, some you'll get the interviews in, get everything. We're going to pair uh, two sites in each episode. So each episode would be about 20-ish minutes long. If it does go on PBS, it'll have to be a little bit longer. Um, so I'll tell jokes or something, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, I'm hope I really hope that there's an appetite for this. That, that people want. Uh, you know, it's very artsy. I mean, it really is. It's it's not. I know it's not for everyone. But I, I am hoping that you know maybe I'm naive that this is something that people would want to see. Yeah, I disagree. Exploring interesting spaces is for everyone, and the more we invite everyone in to appreciate in their own right the great spaces that shape our city, I think that's key to building community. I think one of the things you could think of doing is at some points in the film to have no image at all, to have the music mm. play a kind of uh, mm. continuity with the image. Because I, I sometimes close my eyes when I was looking at it to see you know, what, what's gonna be coming next you know, musically and what's gonna come as an image of the, of the building. But I think it's very interesting what you're doing. It's really sort of celebrating both music and architecture, uh, which are the two most uh, sort of precious things that human beings have, somewhere to live and to listen to something beautiful. I mean, what else can you ask for? So connected. <laughs> Seth, if people have ideas, suggestions, how, how can they share them with you? Yeah, absolutely. So our website is acmusic.org, access contemporary music. You can't Google songs about buildings and moods yet because <laughs> you're enough. the first people to see this. Uh, cool. It's not anywhere yet. Um, but, uh, but if you remember, it's, it's at acmusic.org. Um, uh, Daniel, unfortunately, has to leave right after the event, but I will stick around and, and, and would love to chat with people. I'd love to hear impressions from anybody, uh, what you were thinking as you, as you watched it. Um, TWA and Morris Jumel will be online as part of Open House New York, uh, the virtual presentations. And um, Dee, maybe you can tell us a little bit yeah, about the, what's going this on this weekend. This weekend, over 200 sites are accessible virtually and in real place, real time 
to explore the city and the and the spaces that shape us. And it's poignant that you're here. Uh, Open House New York started soon after 9-11 when, for obvious reasons, New York City could have become a city of locks and barriers. And some very inspired architects and their friends said, what if we opened everything up? What if we invited everyone in? And through that shared experience, that direct experience of the spaces outdoors and in that make this city to start building community and informed uh, citizens who live here, not just citizens, but people who live here. And um, it's, it's an extraordinary organization. I'm a proud board member, um, but I encourage you all to get out and, ex and explore this weekend. And we do programs throughout the year. It's all well, about access. I'm glad you mentioned 9-11 uh, because one of the maybe more neglected experience at, at Ground Zero is an idea I had at the, in a master plan to bring the waterfalls. Mm -hmm. You know, it was highly criticized by the tabloids how crazy it is to bring, you know, Niagara Falls. But I thought of it as a musical intervention. And actually, when you go to that site, in, you know, the busy days of, of New York traffic and police cars and the sirens and fire, you get a kind of introduction, almost like in a Japanese gagaku music, which shields the site in acoustically in a certain musical way. And I've seen people actually sit, stand, and, and I don't know what they're thinking, but uh, I, I think what you said is true, that music has a very important role in public space. In whatever way, you know, whether it's musicians playing, whether it's space conceived in proportions that are suitable to musical experience, or actual musical interventions in space, uh, which are urban in scale. It's profound what you did, and now as the trees mature, yeah, you can the sound of the leaves is part it, of the totally, symphony there. Totally, and, uh, and, and uh, people, movement of people. The, the footsteps of people, it's, it's kind of beautiful. It's music itself. Uh, I think it's wonderful, yeah. I, I think I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous uh, job that you did. Thank you. Well, let's overcome that p pandemic now, which has separated people again, and people have lost faith in buildings. It's amazing how many people moved out of New York thinking that New York is going to be you know, a failure and the better to go to the suburbs. I think it's short-sighted. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, in on a here. positive note, but yes, <laughs> I agree. I, I mean, on a positive note, I think that many people are moving into the city. New York yeah. is coming back Others in many coming, respects, yeah. and it's yeah. a great chance for us to uh, totally. revitalize the arts and and, uh, yeah. and think about some of the equity you know, and inclusion things that, that, that people totally. are starting to talk about. Thank yeah. goodness. Well yeah. overdue. So, yeah. um, Can we have a big hand, please, for our guests? Daniel Liebeskin thank you, thank you, thank you. and Dorothy Don from Open House New York. Uh, I want to thank everybody again for, for coming, um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to chat uh, after, after the show here. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Thanks to Open House New York. Thanks to Carnegie Hall's Ensemble Connect. Um, yeah, fantastic musicians. Thanks to Carnegie Hall for sharing the live stream. Uh, I want to thank TWA. I want to thank Morris Jumel, uh, the sites here in New York. And I want to thank our sponsors, uh, the Alice M. Disson Fund at Columbia University and the Richard H. Treehouse uh, Foundation. Uh, among, I won't keep you here, <laughs> among many others, but uh, all right, thanks again everybody for coming, appreciate it.